Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 2 from the book of Ephesians is titled God's Grand Christ-Centred Plan, ready for teaching on July 8, written by John McVeigh and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 1. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again, your word speaks to us, and this quarter we're looking at the book of Ephesians, and already in last week's lesson we've discovered so many amazing things about your love and your grace for us, and the fact that Paul had this message to write to the church in Ephesus. And as we continue the study this week, we thank you that this lesson will show us more about your grand Christ-centered plan. And we just bless you and thank you for that, because it's only in Jesus that we have salvation, but it's only happening because the plan was in place. And we thank you that we have the opportunity of being part of that plan, of being involved in not only accepting it, but sharing it with those around us, whether it be our family, our community, or in other parts of the world. And Lord, as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. And today I'd like to pray particularly for Myrtle Maundy, for Veronica in Florida and her children, for Marguerite in Barbados, for Shangvol Pashil of Nagaland in the mountains of northeast India, of Claudette Alexander and her family, for Dolores in Las Vegas, for John Mark and Nino in Philippines, and for those many people who are listening in Ghana and Kenya and Ethiopia and those in Perth, Western Australia and Wellington, New Zealand. Lord, we know that we can come to you at any time. And as we open your word, we just pray for your Holy Spirit, not only in our understanding of your word, but in our lives as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Let's read that again, Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Twenty-five years after becoming the first person to walk on the moon, Neil Armstrong wrote a thank you note to the creative team who designed the spacesuit called the Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or EMU, in which he took those historic steps. Calling it the most photographed spacesuit in history and teasing that it was successful at hiding its ugly occupant from view, Armstrong thanked the EMU gang at the Johnson Space Centre for the tough, reliable and almost cuddly suit that preserved his life, sending them a quarter century's worth of thanks and congratulations. Paul begins his letter to the Ephesians with a majestic thank you note, praising God for the blessings he has poured out, blessings as essential to the lives of believers as a spacesuit is for someone who walks on the moon. Paul argues that God has been at work on those essential blessings since before the foundation of the world in verse 4 of chapter 1 and praises God for working through the ages on behalf of believers. Paul's opening here makes Ephesians especially valuable in modelling how to worship God and to praise God for the many blessings he has provided. Sunday, July 2. Chosen and Accepted in Christ. A thank you note usually includes a description of the gift or gifts received. Paul includes a long gift list in Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 14 as he thanks God for the blessings of the gospel. Let's read that passage. Ephesians 1 beginning at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, 
just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Paul praises God for the fact that he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing we read in verse 3. That the blessings are spiritual, the Greek pneumatikos, suggests that they come through the spirit, pneuma, pointing to the closing of Paul's blessing, which celebrates the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers, as we read then in verses 13 and 14. In verses 3 to 6 of Ephesians, it contains inspiring language about how God views us in Christ, Before the creation of the world, God chose us in Christ and determined that we should stand holy and blameless in his presence, as it says in verse 4. And we'll compare that with chapter 5, verse 27. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And as treasured sons and daughters by virtue of both creation and redemption in Christ, we read about in verse 5. Since before the sun began to shine, it has been his strategy that we should be accepted in the beloved, as we read in verse 6. In short, it's God's intention for us to be saved. We lose salvation only by our own sinful choices. What does the phrase in the heavenly places mean in Ephesians, the only place it is used in the New Testament. Study the uses of the phrase, and we're going to look at quite a number of texts here. First of all, Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And verse 20, while he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And chapter 2, verse 6, And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And chapter 3 and verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And chapter 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And we compare that to the use of In the heavens, in chapter 3, verse 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, and chapter 4, verse 10, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things, and chapter 6, verse 9, and you masters do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. 
In Ephesians, the phrases in the heavenly places and in the heavens or in heaven point to heaven as the dwelling place of God. And we looked at that in those verses that we've just read and to the location of spiritual powers. We looked at those as well and to the location of Christ's exaltation at the right hand of the Father, we read in chapter 1, verse 20. Believers have access to these heavenly places in the present as the sphere where spiritual blessings are offered through Christ, as we read in Ephesians 1, 3 and 2, 6. Though the heavenly places have become a place of blessing for believers, they are still the location of conflict from evil powers that contest the Lordship of Christ, as we read in chapter 3, 10 and 6, 12. And so to finish today, Dwell on Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, which says that we have been chosen in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world. Let's read the whole text. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What does that before the foundation of the world mean? How does it reveal to us God's love for us and his desire for us to be saved? Monday, July 3. Costly Redemption, Lavish Forgiveness Sin had been a dark, dominating force in the lives of the members of Paul's audience. Paul can describe them in their prior existence as the walking dead, dead in trespasses and sins, it reads in Ephesians 2 verse 1, yet walking or living as Satan commanded them, as it reads right through. Well, let's just read chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Enslaved to sin and Satan, they had no ability to free themselves. They needed rescue. God has done so through his gracious actions in Christ, and Paul celebrates two new blessings of God's grace in the lives of believers, redemption and forgiveness. Read Ephesians 1 verses 7 and 8. Redemption is an idea that is used frequently in the New Testament. Compare the use of the idea in Colossians 1, Titus 2 and Hebrews 9. What themes do these passages share in common with Ephesians 1, 7 and 8? Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And we compare that with Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And Titus 2, 13 and 14. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And then Hebrews 9 verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. The Greek word translated redemption in Ephesians 1 verse 7 is apolytrosis, originally used for buying a slave's freedom or paying to free a slave. One can hear echoed the voice of the slave trader auctioning his merchandise and the cold grinding of a slave's manacles. When the New Testament discusses redemption, it highlights the costliness of setting the slaves free. 
Our freedom came at an extreme cost. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, we read in Ephesians 1 and verse 7. The idea of redemption also celebrates God's gracious generosity in paying the high price of our liberty. God gives us our freedom and dignity. We are no longer enslaved. Alistair E. McGrath, in What Was God Doing on the Cross, page 78, writes, To be redeemed is to be treated as a person, not an object. It is to become a citizen of heaven rather than a slave of the earth. End of quote. Note carefully that the idea that God pays the price of redemption to Satan is a medieval, not a biblical one. God neither owes nor pays Satan anything. The benefits of Calvary also include the forgiveness of our trespasses, as we read in verse 7 of chapter 1. On the cross, Christ takes upon himself the price of our sin, both past and future. As it says in Colossians 2.14, cancelling the record of debt that stand against us with its legal demands. In doing this work of redemption and forgiveness through Christ, God is acting as our generous Father, with the riches of His grace being lavished upon us, as we read in chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And so to finish the day, what does it mean to you that through Christ's atoning sacrifice you are forgiven and redeemed? What if you feel that you are unworthy of it? Hint, You are unworthy. That's the whole point of the cross. Tuesday, July 4, God's Grand Christ-Centred Plan What is God's plan for the fullness of time? And how extensive is its reach? Let's find out in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that, in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. Paul uses three labels for God's plan. It is one, the mystery of his will, two, his purpose, and three, a plan for the fullness of time. What is God's ultimate final plan? To unite everything, everywhere, in Jesus. The term that Paul uses to describe the plan is a picturesque one. In the Greek, it's anakephali o sastai, which means to head up or to sum up all things in Christ. In ancient accounting practice, you would add up a column of figures and place the total at the top. Jesus heads God's final eschatological plan. This Christ-centred plan was crafted before the foundation of the world, we read in Ephesians 1.4, and is so broad that it encompasses all time, the fullness of the times, and space, all things, things in heaven and things on earth. Paul announces unity in Christ as the grand divine goal for the universe. In discussing God's plan for the fullness of time, as it reads in Ephesians 1.10, Paul shares the theme that he will weave through the letter. God begins his plan to unify all things rooted in the death, resurrection, ascension and exaltation of Jesus. And we'll read about that as we progress through these lessons from chapter 1 verse 15 to chapter 2 verse 10. By founding the church and unifying disparate elements of humankind, Jews and Gentiles in it. And we'll read from 2.11 through to 3.13. In this way... The church signals to the evil powers that God's plan is underway and their diverse rule will end, as we'll read in 3.10. As the Bible says elsewhere, For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Revelation 12.12 
The last half of Paul's letter opens with a passionate call to unity in Ephesians 4 verses 1 to 16 and continues with a lengthy exhortation to avoid behaviour that damages unity and instead to build solidarity with fellow believers in chapter 4 verse 17 right through to chapter 6 verse 9. Paul concludes with the rousing image of the church as a unified army, participating with vigour in waging peace in Christ's name, in chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. So to finish the day, how can you acknowledge and celebrate that the redemption you have experienced in Christ Jesus is part of something sweeping and grand, an integral part of God's studied and ultimate plan to unite all things in Christ. Wednesday, July 5 Living in Praise of His Glory Ephesians 1 verses 11 and 12 read, In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. The believers in Ephesus seem to have lost a clear sense of who they are as Christians, to have lost heart, as we read in Ephesians 3.13. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. In line with what he has earlier affirmed in chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, Paul wishes again to shore up their identity as Christians. Believers are not victims of haphazard, arbitrary decisions by various deities or astral powers. They are the children of God, as we read in verse 5, and have access to many blessings through Christ based on the deep counsels and eternal decisions of God. It is God's purpose, counsel and will, we read in verse 11 here, that is being worked out in their lives in line with the still wider plan of God to unite all things, as we read yesterday in verse 10. They may have unshakable confidence in their standing before God and in the effectiveness of the blessings He provides. Their lives should shout the message of Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Compare the use of the idea of inheritance in Ephesians 1 verses 11, 14 and 18. Why do you think this idea is important to Paul? Ephesians 1 verse 11 in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Have you ever received an inheritance as the result of someone's death? Perhaps a relative left you a valuable treasure or a considerable sum of money? In Paul's view, by virtue of the death of Jesus, Christians have received an inheritance from God, as we read in verse 14, and become an inheritance to God, as we read in verse 18. In the Old Testament, God's people are sometimes thought of as being his heritage or inheritance, as we read in Deuteronomy 9.29, Yet they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out by your mighty power and by your outstretched arm. And Deuteronomy 32 verse 9, For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the place of his inheritance. And Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 12, And the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. 
This sense of being or becoming God's inheritance is clear in Ephesians 1.18 and is the likely meaning of the term in Ephesians 1.11 as well, which would then be translated, In Him we have become an inheritance. As a central element in their Christian identity, Paul wishes believers to know their value to God. They not only possessed an inheritance from God, as we read in verse 14, but in Ephesians 3 verse 6 we read that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And we'll compare that with chapter 5 verse 5. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. But they are God's inheritance. And so to finish today, what is the difference between working to get something and inheriting it instead? How does this idea help us understand what we've been given in Jesus? Thursday, July 6, The Holy Spirit, Seal and Down Payment In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, Paul tells in brief the conversion story of his readers. What are the steps in that story? Let's read those verses again, Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 13. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. In exploring the importance of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers, Paul uses two images or metaphors for the Spirit. He first pictures the Holy Spirit as a seal, identifying a sealing presence of the Spirit that occurs from the time of conversion. In ancient times, seals were used for a wide variety of functions, to authenticate copies of laws and agreements, to validate the excellence or quantity of a container's contents, as in Ezekiel 28, or to witness transactions, as in Jeremiah 32, contracts, letters, as in 1 Kings 21, wills and adoptions. Imprinted on an object, a seal announced both ownership and protection. The presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives marks believers as belonging to God and conveys God's promise to protect them. And we compare that with Ephesians 4 verse 30 And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. They have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, we read in verse 13. Jerry Moskala, writing in Misinterpreted End Time Issues, Five Myths in Adventism, from the Journal of the Adventist Theological Society, Volume 28, Number 1, page 95, writes, Paul plainly states that at the moment one gives his or her life to Jesus and believes in him, the Holy Spirit seals the Greek verb shrizagizo, that believer in Christ for the day of redemption. Wonderful, liberating and reassuring truth. The Spirit of God marks Christ's followers with the seal of salvation right when they first believe. End of quote. The second image Paul uses for the Holy Spirit is that of guarantee. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance, which looks toward the moment when the inheritance is to be given in full. As we read in 2 Corinthians 1.22, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And 2 Corinthians 5 verse 5, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. The word translated guarantee, arabon, was a Hebrew loan word that was used widely in the common or Koine Greek or New Testament times to indicate a first instalment, a deposit, 
or down payment that requires the payer to make additional payments. Note that believers do not pay this down payment, but receive it from God. The treasured presence of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers, says Paul, is the first instalment of the full inheritance of salvation and redemption that will come with the return of Christ. Our job is to receive with a grateful and submissive heart what we have been offered in Jesus. Friday, July 7. Does Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 to 14 teach that God predetermines the futures of human beings, predestining some to everlasting life and others to everlasting death? Many people unfortunately believe this. Consider, however, these ideas. 1. In the passage, the role of Christ is determinative, since the divine choice to adopt us occurs through Jesus Christ in chapter 1 verse 5, or in him in verses 4 and 11. This suggests that God's election and predetermination are exercised toward all who choose faith in Christ, rather than selecting who will be saved or lost on a case-by-case basis even before people are born. God's decision is the studied, predetermined, divine response to those who exercise faith in Christ. 2. Ephesians 1, 3-14 also contains vivid relational language about God's work of salvation. God is Father, and we are his adopted children, we read in verses 3 to 5, who receive his blessings in bountiful measure in verse 8. We must understand the language about God's choice and predetermination in the light of this rich relational language. God is not a distant, unfeeling judge who makes decrees from afar, but the caring father of all his children, as we see in Ephesians 3.15, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. 3. That God honours human choice is reflected in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, especially verse 13, where hearing and believing are judged to be important. Elsewhere in the letter, in Ephesians 2, 8 and Ephesians 3, 17 and Ephesians 4, 1, right through to chapter 6 and verse 20, all of which emphasise or presume the existence of choice and the response of faith. And in other passages in the New Testament, for example in 1 Timothy 2 and Acts 17, or as Ellen G. White expressed it in Steps to Christ, page 68, in the matchless gift of his Son, God has encircled the whole world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air which circulates around the globe. All who choose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, what arguments would you add to those given above supporting the idea that God does not pick and choose before we have been created who will be saved and who will be lost? Two, whose choice ultimately decides whether or not a person has salvation in Jesus? Three, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, we read in Ephesians 1, seven. How does this verse reveal the reality of salvation by faith alone and not by the works of the law? And for today's inside story, here's Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Remarkable Path to Lebanon by Kathy Lichtenwalter Volunteer teacher Juan Oliveira struggled to listen to the speaker at an I Will Go mission training event at Middle East University in Beirut, Lebanon. Where have I seen that guy before, he wondered. Ruan had arrived from Brazil to serve as a volunteer teacher at the Adventist Learning Centre, which teaches Syrian refugee children in grades 1 to 8. He was listening to a university teacher, Brian Manley, describe the work of tent makers, 
Seventh-day Adventists who follow Apostle Paul's example of using their profession to work in non-Christian countries. Ruan pulled out his cell phone and began to scroll through years of photos. Mission was in Ruan's blood. Born in Brazil, he had grown up in a family that talked and lived mission. As a high school student, he accompanied his parents to Argentina for an I Will Go mission conference in 2017. His heart was deeply touched as he heard about the needs of the Middle East. During his first year of university studies, he accepted an invitation to teach English in a non-Christian country in Asia. Soon after he arrived, however, the language school closed. He stayed to study the local language, but he was forbidden from mentioning God to anyone. Returning to Brazil for his second year of university, Juan felt a strong desire to go abroad again. He filled out several applications for openings in the Middle East, the region that had captured his imagination at the 2017 conference in Argentina. God, it's up to you, he prayed as he sent off the applications on vividfaith.com, the Adventist Church's official website for volunteers. I will accept the first response that I get. Seven minutes later, a message popped up on his phone. It was from the Adventist Learning Centre in Beirut. Rowan arrived at the school six weeks later. After Asia, he had an appreciation for the religious freedom in Lebanon. I can even tell them I am a Christian, he said. After a year in Lebanon, Rowan intends to finish his studies and become a full-time missionary. His conviction that God has called him was reaffirmed when he remembered where he had seen Brian Manley previously. After Manley finished speaking at the conference, Rowan approached him, phone in hand. I know where I've seen you before, he said, scrolling back five years to show a photo of him and his parents with Manley at the conference in Argentina in 2017. It was Manley's presentation about tent makers at the conference that had stirred Duran's heart to serve God in the Middle East. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born initially read as Eyes for the Visually Impaired through Christian Services for the Blind in Australia and New Zealand. It became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon, with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, Remember, God is always faithful.